Mindset on Web3 Forum within the AIM Congress taking place today in the Future Room at, at ADNIC in Abu Dhabi. I really hope that you already have a lot of uh, interesting networking sessions. How much are you enjoying today's AIM uh, meeting? Tell us. Did you enjoy it, yes? Please be louder. I'm, I'm pretty sure. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you, Angelina. Thank you. That's, thank you so much for everyone who's joined us today. So uh, the thing is that for everyone who's here, we, you have an amazing opportunity also to find out more about investments as well in Web3 space. So we're really happy to start our Finiverse Arabia Virtual Asset and Web3 Forum today at Future Room at Adnik in Abu Dhabi. Thank you, everyone who has joined us today. And definitely, by the way, invite all of your friends to join us because for the next couple of hours, you're going to hear a lot of exciting keynote speeches and panel discussions and fireside chats. So here with Finiverse, we're bringing the Web3 ecosystems of Asia and the Middle East, bringing together speakers and attendees from both regions to explore virtual asset and Web3 opportunities across two of the most important global hubs, UAE and Hong Kong. In addition to this, it's truly remarkable to partner for the first time with the annual, annual investment meeting, a global investment platform and conference aiming to facilitate cross-border investment and promote sustainable development. All of these goals are really compatible with the Finiverse Tour Arabia mission. We started the Universe Arabia Tour back in Dubai, in the Museum of the Future. And, you know, we continue our journey aiming to facilitate much closer collaboration and explore investment opportunities between the fintech and Web3 industry professionals all over UAE and Hong Kong, both from both of these amazing global hubs. You'll have a chance today to network with them. Please share your knowledge, share your ideas, and maybe you also will be held, uh, you will have the opportunity to explore potential collaboration. This highly anticipated event was initiated, with, initiated by Finiverse, the company that aims to build strong bridges between the vibrant Asian and Middle Eastern Web3 and FinTech ecosystems and gather together the key regional decision makers and industry leaders. Finiverse, the organizer of the famous Hong Kong FinTech Week that pro brought over 1,000 FinTech and Web3 startups, over 80 unicorns on our stages, has also now bigger plans for the Middle East region and is opening an office in Dubai. So without a further ado, let's dive together deeper in the world of Finiverse. And for this, please welcome on stage our moderator, Anthony Saar, CEO and co-founder of Finiverse, one of the largest FinTech and Web3 event organizers and communities in Asia. He will talk, uh, by the way, he will be joining today by, and please welcome as well on stage, Wailun Kwok, Executive Director at ADGM, give him a big hand. Welcome on stage, Angelina Kwan, Managing Director at Stratford Finance, and Lucy Gasmaridan, Founder and Managing Partner at Token Pay Capital. They will talk today and will tell you about navigating the Web3 and virtual asset investment landscape opportunities in Asia and the Middle East. Please give them a big hand. Thank you very much for finding time to attend this interesting conversation that will take place at the AIM. Um, we're very grateful for the warm welcome of Abu Dhabi. We, as Maria just mentioned, we've been uh, 
last couple of days spent in Dubai, uh, and we enjoyed today uh, learning about the landscape of uh, virtual assets regulations here in, Web in Abu Dhabi in ADGM. And we have an honor today to have this conversation joined by Mr. Walun Kwok, who is pretty much the pioneer in the regulation of the virtual assets. I remember uh, visiting EDGM back 2019, it was early days, and I think the EDGM was the first global regulator that started to set this framework for on the regulation of digital assets. Um, and it's interesting to see the progress done over the years. Um, and I guess one thing that before I will pass to uh, Walum to open this conversation. One interesting thing about him that many people don't know is outside of his professional uh, side uh, as a regulator, uh, he is very passionate about music. <laughs> and Can you talk louder? Yes. Uh, talk louder. Do you hear me? Yes. He's, uh, uh, Mr. Walum is passionate yes. about the music and he's a vivid piano player. He spends his time on with with the piano and it's amazing when hopefully one day we'll be able to hear it from you Woo. but let's get into the business so i'd like to start the uh, conversation with um the point that we, we've been visiting different regulators meeting uh, in in this region and obviously since 2018 2017 when you started uh, 2016 almost um the space becoming more and more mature more uh, regulators uh, coming in, coming up with their uh, frameworks. How do you see from the from the point of view of over these years? Um, what was the best, biggest learning, and, and how do you see this uh, the landscape evolved in UAE and in global globally? I think Can everyone hear me, or, or is that mic better? Yeah, this is better, Anthony. Oh, it is better. Yeah, okay. This this right. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Anthony. Um, so, a bit of background uh, as to my journey here, right? Um, I used to be a regulator with the Singapore Monetary Authority. Um, and back in 2015, when I joined ADGM eight years ago, uh, my role was to create a regulatory function uh, to supervise the industry in the ADGM, which is the International Financial Center of Abu Dhabi, right? And back then, the vision of the government is to diversify away from the oil and gas sector. And finance is one of the key pillars. Uh, and so the International Financial Center is to attract uh, international financial services players into the region to serve the region, as well as to support uh, local uh, champions to expand overseas through the common law framework that we have and the platform we have. Uh, for them to serve the wider global um, sector, right? So, uh, October 2015 was the day we went live. Um, since then, um, we have eight years has passed, and I would say, looking back, um, one of the key decisions that we make as a regulator was to embrace financial innovation in a big way, and. And the good thing is that we are starting from scratch with no legacy issues. Uh, hence, we are able to think about rules and regulations that are ready for the digital economy of the future. Right? So um, I'm glad that uh, today we take pride as probably one of the most progressive and sophisticated fintech regulator in this region. We are the first regulator in this region to push the boundary of fintech. In 2016, when we first launched, our frame, fintech framework, uh, the term fintech wasn't really bandied around. No one exactly knew what is that. So when we sort of push the envelope, you see the other regulators around the world, around the region, set up and take notice and decided to also support the industry um, in the same um, uh, um, with the with the larger objective of supporting financial innovation. So I'll just stop there for a while. I'm sure there are a lot of uh, other things that we can deep dive into. Uh, but by and large, uh, with the support of the Abu Dhabi government, the vision, um, I think um, it has made our job easier as a regulator. And for me, uh, that journey of being able to start something from Greenfield uh, has been a very, very liberating experience. 
Uh, thank you, Willem. And we will be diving a little bit more in, into depths of the, the regulation oh. here. But before that, I would like to introduce our next guest. And we are honored to have Angelina Kwon joining us. Angelina is uh, pretty much one of the most ex advanced experts in regulation of, regulatory uh, of the digital assets. She spent over eight years in the Securities and Futures Commissions, uh, uh, Commission of Hong Kong. Um, after, before she was also head of two large uh, virtual assets companies, and now she's advising quite a few digital assets firms. So Angelina, uh, and just also one interesting note about Angelina outside of your professional side that also not many people know, that Angelina is a vivid collector of jade. She has over a thousand of jade pieces you can see on her. She's always carrying one piece of jade with, uh, or a few pieces of jade with her. Um, so, Angelina, you've spent a couple of days already uh, pretty packed with meetings, uh, learning about the ecosystem here, understanding f what Hong Kong can learn so far from, from UAE, given that Hong Kong also has recently announced a pivot towards opening up towards Web3 and issuing licenses for the virtual assets for retail use. I have to say, um, and thank you um, for bringing us here, for Finiverse uh, bringing us to um, uh, the Middle East. It's been an exciting, eye-opening trip of what has gone on in terms of the growth uh, and in terms of what um, your regulatory agency has done in terms of setting up an entire ecosystem. And I think for Hong Kong, we've gone through a tough patch for virtual assets. We were one of the first uh, countries to actually have a number of golden unicorns. Uh, we had BitMEX, uh, Binance sort of started in Hong Kong, and we had a number of Crypto.com, FTX, that's all started in Hong Kong. But when the regulators decided, oh, we're not gonna allow retail to trade, that's when we started seeing an exodus of people leaving. And what I've learned is in, in, in all these countries, there are, especially here um, in Abu Dhabi, people are really welcoming to virtual assets. And if you don't take care of your market participants, you may lose them to other markets. And that's why it's so important. And now Hong Kong really has its mojo back in place in that a new uh, virtual asset uh, consultation process has just been completed. Uh, they will allow retail to uh, trade uh, digital assets, thank God. Um, and therefore, a very clear regime will be coming out. But I don't see it as competition. I see it as collaboration, if anything. Because as more um, digital asset firms become regulated, um, it's a better thing. And virtual assets are borderless. If they have licenses here that they can serve uh, customers here, and they have licenses in Hong Kong, they can serve Asia Pacific clients. Everybody wins together. And I think there'll be more and more collaboration between uh, regulated companies um, as they get additional licenses. So I think the most exciting thing is the growth that's been happening in Abu Dhabi in your um, financial um, center. The, your offices were amazing and just the whole regime that you really want to do business, that's where Hong Kong is moving back into right now, and I can only see more collaboration and cooperation together. So. Thank you, Angelina, and we will be talking about collaboration. Um, but before that, I would like to introduce our third guest, Lucy Gazmarian. She is, um, she is very experienced on, on the crypto side, been working for PwC for a number of years in the crypto team, uh, consulting, bu building the regulatory frameworks for f fintech, crypto, in a number of jurisdictions. At, before she decided to drop the career in consulting and start her own VC fund, and now she is head of Token Bay Capital, investing in, in, in early stage startups. And, and I'm, I'm one thing that if you ever wondered uh, who would do their finals paper in Oxford in Leighton, there are only a handful of people in the world, and one of them is Lucy. Um, um, Lucy, uh, from, from the investors' 
perspective. Uh, I, I understand that all the startups are now recently starting to realize that they need to take the regulation very serious. And the regulation, they should take the regulation very serious even before they starting their business. So how do you see this, the change of the mindset uh, within the founders that happening at the moment? What, what, what these startups um, now should be focusing on? Um, thanks so much, Anton. Oh, I can, I can hear everything when, when I speak. That's great. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for being here and, and joining. Um, so when it comes to the startups that I work with, it's been interesting because when I first got into crypto early 2018, it wasn't really top of mind for startups to be regulatory first, which is really what I call, call the startups today. Um, why? Because the regulators weren't there yet. You know, they hadn't built frameworks. They had very, very limited understanding, um, really just trying to get their heads around it. And I used to go around the world. I did the IOSCO sort of uh, annual meeting uh, telling them all about this new technology. But there wasn't really the interest or the urgency or the appetite, actually, to learn too much about it because at that time, crypto equaled money laundering. And, and it kind of you know, began and ended there. What's happened now, of course, is that the use cases for crypto technology and blockchain have really proliferated and accelerated. And the regulators are now competing to actually attract this talent with very comprehensive regu regulatory frameworks. So we've got them in Hong Kong, we've got them in Singapore, obviously we've got them right here, UAE, Abu Dhabi, uh, Dubai. Um, and so there is now choice for startups and they can be regulatory first. So it will be one of the things that they think about when they're launching their startup, when they're looking at the types of activities they're going to be engaging in or what their product or service is. And they can pick and choose the regulatory jurisdiction where they're going to innovate and where they're going to build their business. So that's a really exciting time that we're in now. Because looking at 2018, looking at 2023, I think the growth trajectory for startups now is going to be faster because that really was the missing piece. It's very hard to get investors coming in to grow your business when there's uncertainty around what regulators will, will think about it and ultimately from one day to the next can just come and shut down your business. Uh, I mean, the thing about crypto, is, is, uh, as we sort of alluded to earlier, it, you can jump around from jurisdiction to jurisdiction because it is borderless. But startups don't want to do that, right? Most want to work with, in a regulatory framework and with regulators. So um, that's an exciting time. And, uh, and yeah, it's part of the roadmap now. And certainly from my perspective as an investor, that's definitely one of the first questions that I will ask. And really, only founders that are thinking about this and having awareness around regulations will be the ones that sort of grab my attention. Because believe you me, there are a lot of very young founders in crypto innovating in decentralized finance and have no idea. They don't even understand why regulations exist. They're like, why can't we just do peer-to-peer -peer financial services? You know, because they don't have the experience. And so you know, we need that all to come together. So it's a very exciting time to actually start collaborating with, with regulators. If I can just add a quick comment on that. Uh, in our experience in dealing with the startups in our sandbox program, uh, you, you actually realize that they want to operate with the regulator because the investors actually want them to interact and be regulated by the regulators, right? Uh, most of the regulators um, most of the investors in the UAE actually see the regulatory um, licensing as a stamp of approval. Right? In fact, the startups see it as a means to raise capital from the investors. So it's something which is perhaps unique within the UAE environment and landscape, uh, but certainly uh, I see uh, the startups wanting to be regulated, wanting to be near the regulator because they know that working in the compliant way is more sustainable as well as, uh, I suppose, it opens up the conversation with uh, attracting uh, capital from the investors. Yeah. Can I just add that it's very much a huge shift from the early days in 2016, 2017, when crypto started to come out with exchanges, and now you're seeing a sea change where they're realizing, you're right, 
that getting a license and um, complying is the way of the future because you're seeing what happened with FTX. They don't want to go down this route anymore. They want to be very different and want to be there for their investors. And I think this FTX might have been the best thing for regulators. Um, I shouldn't say that, but <laughs> it, it, their demise has actually uh, brought the crypto regulation or digital asset regulation uh, to be in the forefront and how and to properly have licensing regimes in place is going to be the future. And the most exciting thing is this is going to be a really great asset class. And uh, this is the thing that we've always believed in, but now it's coming to fruition. I think that ultimately we're talking about the trust and building the trust, gaining the trust from the customers. That's the critical for the further adoption of, 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 this, of the crypto and in, in virtual assets. And one of the way, ways to achieve this trust is to get regulated, uh, uh, being transparent, be compliant, so that regulators can watch for you. And therefore, people will have more confidence to use your product. But I can't just stop but thinking, remembering, uh, it was a few months ago, uh, we were at, in Hong Kong, uh, hosting Hong Kong FinTech Week. And I was talking to Sam Bankman Friday, it was November, uh, before he went on stage dialing in uh, um, from, from the Bahamas. And he was uh, basically saying that they are the most regulated exchange in the world, have meetings with hundreds of regulators, getting consultations, approvals, and, and what happened later we know. So, Wailum, uh, how we can, as, as how we regulators can um, uh, sort of overcome these challenges? And what are the other challenges that you're facing at the moment? So, I think in order to answer the question, I need to explain a bit of our regulatory approach. Uh, when we first launched the uh, virtual asset framework in 2018, right? uh, back then the conversation, I remember end of 2017, February 2018, uh, the conversation by most global regulators was about AML CFT risks. Uh, and that was the only thing the regulators were looking at. Right? Um, then we, my, my boss and myself sort of discussed and said, look, is that the only risk that we are seeing in this sector? And we spoke to several institutional players and they're saying, in order for us to mainstream this asset class, you need to look wider than just AML CFT. And we took the cue. Um, we look at introducing a framework that it's almost taken from the threat fire world uh, to bear upon the crypto asset as an asset class, right? So we look at AML CFT, we look at market abuse provisions, we look at safe custody and client protection, client money protection, we look at investor protection and disclosure, we look at technology governance, right? And today we are still, we are probably the one of the few regulators that actually took a merit approach to approving crypto assets that are offered in our center. Uh, might not be sustainable in the long run, but we thought that for us to adopt a very conservative approach from day one, a very robust and strict approach from day one, a very golden standard from day one, is probably the easiest way for a regulator to venture into that space. Right? So today, with all the things that have happened with AT, uh, FTX's collapse, uh, we are quite glad to say that there has not been any knee-jerk reaction either on our part because the rules and regulations are already there. You see the rest of the global uh, regulatory community uh, looking at their rules and regulations now, reviewing an update to make it uh, fit for purpose. Uh, but we find ourselves actually, yeah, I don't think there's much that we need to do. We probably need to tweak here and there and just continue to monitor uh, developments very, very closely uh, to ensure that we are in line with international best practices. Right? So the challenge um, for us back then as a first mover, right, uh, I remember looking at various regulators around the world. There was only the New York Department of Financial Services. There was only the Japanese uh, uh, regulator who are look, regulating this space and there wasn't anyone else and we have to actually come up with our own thinking about how to uh, regulate this space um, and being the first mover has got a huge challenge of trying to educate the industry right think of trying to regulate Facebook from day one right they are technology operator for the longest of time ask them to try to be regulated and understand the mindset of regulator is so difficult right how do you convert them to believe in the rules and regulations 
that you're applying. So that's one thing, convincing the, reg, uh, the industry to be regulated. Uh, and then you have the whole enabling ecosystem around um, the um, fellow regulators, the banks who are prepared to pre uh, bank these uh, players, the auditors who are prepared to audit uh, these firms. Right? So we find ourselves having to educate the ecosystem players in this region. Right? And it took us, we launched our framework in 2018, and it took us only about 2020 where we crossed the line of licensing perhaps our first uh, entity. Right? And that's because the journey of two and a half years was very much about educating the industry and, and educating uh, the service providers. Right? So, so if FTX back then were to sort of come to us um, and I think they'll probably be scared of our rules and regulations um, because it's just so out of this world in terms of being so uh, uh, restrictive and um, stringent, right? Just imagine a securities regulator, I mean, a technology firm being subject to the full brunt of the securities regulations. So that's a pretty difficult hurdle to cross. And uh, talking about education, uh, Angelina, from your point of view, you, you've been talking to many companies that are looking to get licensed. What do you feel what do you see the most common mistake or misconception uh, from these founders who are looking to get the license? What are the typical mistakes they do or typical mis misunderstandings? I've helped um, uh, one very big Chinese um, digital asset firm just get their licenses. And I think the biggest um, misconception by uh, digital asset providers is that they're sort of immune from putting in the same controls as traditional financial services firms. Well, guess what? If you have a fiduciary duty where you're holding assets for clients, then you owe them a duty of care. And that lack of appreciation that you need to safeguard your assets, you need to protect um, your, your uh, firm from being hacked, you need to make sure that you have proper record keeping in place. Um, and basically, same products, same controls. If you're a securities dealer, you have to have segregated accounts and you can't commingle um, your funds with other funds. And all of these things are not really in the minds of the early crypto firms. They were so into technology and buying and selling that they forgot about the need to protect investors. And I think um, Wailam's early um, licensing regime started that whole shift towards investor protection. And I think that, plus all the different regimes that are now coming in place, and in Hong Kong, it's all about investor protection as well as having internal controls in place and a lot of the firms never thought about, oh, you know what, I need to have a secure uh, uh, a server room. I need to make sure that there's pen tests, or I need to make sure that our clients have gone through KYC properly. Most firms early on, about five years ago, wouldn't even KYC. And that's uh, know your client rules and uh, actually go and even just do a check that the client was actually not some Iranian uh, uh, I don't know, some terrorist or something like that. So now you're seeing a whole shift um, where you're getting more and more uh, properly regulated and firms are very much aware and hiring the right people and putting in the right systems in place. And I think it's very, very exciting. Um, th so you're seeing that sea change that, that I think Abu Dhabi was one of the first to really do. So. It's, it's interesting talking about the misunderstandings. Uh, since Hong Kong recently made a massive announcement that they're turning the green light for Web3 companies to come, I think there's a lot of uh, aspirations among, within the community that yep. to the point of the people can perceive Hong Kong now as sort of like Macau for Web3 gambling. And, and Lucy, you're sitting at the, at, the, at the board of advisory board of SFC that grants these licenses. Um, what's, what's your insight? How, when we will see it, the licenses will be issued, whom you think they will be receiving, any, anything that you can 
give us a little bit of uh, insight. Next question. <laughs> no. um, I mean, in all seriousness, uh, listen, to generalize about the, the approach of the SFC, they're far more open. So if we, if we go back to this time last year, uh, President Xi had not gone to Hong Kong and basically given Hong Kong the mainland's blessing to become a crypto hub. You know, China has banned crypto. Um, they banned it for many years. They banned it in 2013, 2017. They banned it in the most extreme way in 2021. And Hong Kong as a crypto hub, which um, it was well known for uh, back in the day, as, as Angelina said, many of the most successful, most powerful crypto exchanges were all born in Hong Kong. So it really has like crypto DNA uh, in Hong Kong. Um, they all had to leave, right? Because the messaging was not coming through from Hong Kong that it was permitted, even though there is one country, two systems. Um, actually, it required the SFC to come out and actually have a statement on it. So it's been incredible watching how Hong Kong has actually taken this opportunity because they came out, Hong Kong FinTech Week, uh, November of last year and made uh, you know, a very big public statement to the world that they want to be a virtual asset hub. Not just that they're going to allow these businesses to operate, but they're going to come out with a comprehensive framework. They want to um, entice all the most successful crypto businesses to come to Hong Kong. And this is from the top down. So no longer is it grassroots sort of trying to push uh, from the bottom up. Actually, the government is setting up virtual asset task force. The securities regulator is talking to the central bank. They're all working together to come out with very comprehensive regulation. And what we're going to have from the 1st of June is a very clear crypto asset framework for centralized exchanges um, that gives with a 361 page document, they are really giving details on what they want you to do. And this is the big criticism, for example, in the US, where it's very gray, there's no clarity. Well, Hong Kong regulator, the securities regulator, is being extremely prescriptive, and that's welcomed by the industry. The other thing that I'll say is the central bank, as I say, the HKMA is getting involved, and they're going to be bringing out stablecoin regulation. Uh, maybe this year, but definitely by the first quarter of 2024. And that's really important because having fiat money on a blockchain is sort of the missing piece for this whole ecosystem to take off. So it's just showing how coordinated the approach is now in Hong Kong. Um, and that's the wonderful thing about being in Asia is when they mobilize, they mobilize, right? And so um, I do think it's an incredibly exciting uh, time and opportunity uh, for Hong Kong now. So I'm thrilled to be uh, part of the SFC's advisory group. My role, given that I'm identifying very exciting, new, innovative Web3 crypto businesses, is really to feed back to the SFC because this is emerging technology and it changes all the time, it's developing all the time. And so they want that sort of dialogue um, to, to really understand what's going on from the grassroots level. So that's what I'm going to be bringing to the table. But in terms of any insights into uh, insider conversations with the regulators, I think I'll, I'll leave that uh, for now. Um, it's interesting that in contrary to Hong Kong, uh, Singapore has taken an opposite approach. I'm going to say more conservative approach. Um, it's, they were uh, pretty, MAS was uh, very proactive in the space uh, recently, but given the certain, the, the unfortunate uh, events that took place with other, a few companies, I think the, the MAS taken more sort of distant and a little bit more conservative. Wailum, you spent your career in MAS before joining at the GM. What's your take on, on what's both Hong Kong's uh, and, and Singapore sort of uh, views towards the crypto at the moment? Uh, just want to caveat that this is my observation from an external party, right? So it may not be right, it may not be wrong. Right? Uh, but having worked in MAS before, I would still say that they are an innovative, progressive regulator. Uh, the approach taken for crypto for them back then was more like let's open up and see what comes in, right? 
and they haven't made a call as to how they want to approach it, right? But of course, the way the industry operates is once they come in, they will start promoting themselves and marketing. So there was a natural buzz that sort of went on their own. Uh, and, and I think MES probably didn't manage that or control that. They just let the industry continue uh, evolving, right? Um, and my take is that back then, MES also haven't really decided or land on a particular um, focus on what would be a... Uh, um, use cases that are going to be very impactful or pragmatic, right? So it comes to a point where by the time they have started to move in a way and see what the industry is like, uh, it comes to a point, I think Ravi Manon made this very public in that uh, the cryptocurrencies has taken a life of their own, right? Where people actually invest in cryptocurrencies uh, with a view to get a return when there's no uh, relationship to the underlying uh, blockchain, right? And he reiterated the point that the cryptocurrencies are actually native uh, tokens to drive the utility of the DLT, right? So um, I think it's almost like, um, to me, they come to a point where they um, realize that uh, we need to give stronger guidance as to what they think are very pos uh, more constructive use cases for the real economy. Uh, and I think that's probably where they are now. But I think by and large, where they see uh, impactful, innovative firm, they are still very, very open about supporting that. Yeah. Whereas in um, ADGM, um, I think um, we are quite fortunate that um, at the end of the day, we are a small, country, we are a small jurisdiction. Right? Uh, even if we have our launch our framework in 2018, uh, no one is going to choose us as the first port of call. So in that sense, the natural selection that came to ADGM are not really um, the biggest, are not necessarily um, um, the most um, um, aggressive, right? So I think um, not that we managed to control it well, but I think somehow by some quirk of fate and luck, uh, the ecosystem has grown quite in a quite well-balanced manner. Uh, we have crypto exchanges, we have custodies, we have now a budding ecosystem. And with the recent launch by Hub Seventy One on uh, promoting or bringing in Web Three Point Zero uh, blockchain firms into the region to broaden the ecosystem, uh, we are starting to see players like Game Five coming in. Uh, we are starting to see the infrastructure players, uh, Layer One, Layer Two, coming in to support the ecosystem. Um, and I think what excites me in the near term is that we have recently issued a consultation paper for a DLT Foundations regime which I think will uh, bring a wider segment of uh, blockchain projects uh, into um, the center, not looking at just um, um, financial services, but the broader application of the Web 3.0 economy. Yeah. Angelina, do you have any comment on, on the topic of um, MAS, uh, SFC? MGM? I think what's interesting out of all of this, and. Um, I knew Ilum when he was at the MAS, and I work very closely with uh, MAS um, and have been licensed by them before. But what appears to me that if you're going to make a decision to regulate something, you either have to go all in or you're not going to win. So you can see that, for example, Hong Kong, um, in the beginning, it was sort of like, you know what, we really don't want to regulate this, but we're sort of stuck with this. And then now they've made a decision that, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do it right. And because of it, the whole environment in Hong Kong has changed because we made a decision to do this going forward. Um, in Abu Dhabi, they made a decision to go forward and a lot of participants sought out and came to the ADGM to get licenses and it's become a destination and Hong Kong will become a destination. Singapore was a first mover also, but all of a sudden, I think with the FTX issue, they've slowed down. There's 170 applications that are waiting, that are pending approval and they've all stopped. And I think that reflection right now is causing a bit of consternation for Singapore. So either they're going to have to make a decision to move forward or change their tact. 
but they've already reaped quite a bit of um, benefits because they were one of the first to attract people to come to Singapore. I'm going to grandfather you. Please come in and, and, and set up and you can set up here and that's great. But now the question is what's going to happen going forward. But you can see that our markets like Hong Kong, uh, Abu Dhabi uh, and other markets around the world are already starting to benefit. Who is losing out of all of this is actually the United States. Although they're one of the largest markets in the world, their indecision to come up with a key regulator, their indecision to have uh, parceled licenses like the New York DFS who has a good licensing regime versus, um, oops, time's up, uh, licenses uh, that are separate. That's going to be an issue that's going to affect the United States and um, their digital asset plans. So that's just some views. And by the way, later today, um, we will be also covering, I think, aspects of what, hap what happens now in the U.S. from our guest from Washington, Angela, who will be speaking further, more, giving a little bit more context, I guess. But before that, um, uh, Lucy, uh, it seems like with the crypto winter out, out there, the cold winter, um, and regulators are scrutinizing crypto even more, what, how do you see this space will be evolving? And, and, and when we will see the light? So it really depends um, in what part of the world you're in, whether you're feeling the crypto chill or not, because crypto, whether we like it or not, is solving real world use cases. So if you're sitting in the US or even in Hong Kong, um, you're probably pretty well banked, you have access to financial services, you know, you have the US dollar as your, as your currency uh, for everyday payments. But if you're sitting in a country that has over 100% inflation rate or a corrupt central bank that is incompetent and cannot actually govern uh, their monetary system, you are using crypto. And this is what I think people do not appreciate enough is that crypto is being used by people that find it very useful. It's, it's a solution to um, a lot of issues around the world, particularly in emerging markets, particularly in Latin America. So I think, yes, uh, media is, is, is saying that there's crypto winter, but if you actually look at the fundamental metrics of the space, developer activity, so more and more people that are building these crypto applications, developing and writing smart contract code, they are growing in number every year, at least 5% increase year on year, even in a crypto winter. You've got more and more users interacting with blockchains, with more and more digital wallets, all of these sort of metrics people also don't appreciate in a crypto winter. But the, the whole industry is moving forwards regardless of the price of Bitcoin, which is basically used as a, as a proxy for the health of the ecosystem. But, you know, the fluctuations and the volatility in the price should not be used as an indicator of how much pro progressive activity is taking place. So um, while the headlines and if you're looking at the price of Bitcoin, you think there's a crypto winter. But believe you me, if you're working with startups and seeing what they're building and what they're innovating and all the exciting applications that are coming along, there's no crypto winter. So um, I think it's uh, it, it's just a a generally an, an upward cycle because um, there's very broad acceptance that where we're moving is from an internet of information to an internet of value and that's really the, the, the next era of the internet and the next era of a global digital economy which we're all going to be part of uh, whether we like it or not. So um, it's, uh, it's a very uh, exciting time to be in the space regardless of any crypto winter headlines. We are pretty much running out of time, but I just want to ask one quick question from each uh, panelist, uh, very briefly. For those companies, founders, that are looking for opportunities, whether in the Middle East, uh, Hong Kong, Asia, what will be one piece of advice that you will give them in the crypto, in the virtual space, uh, virtual asset space? I mean, as a regulator, I give the boring answer, and that is, I think longer term, in order for you to operate in this space and be serious uh, about attracting institutional participation, uh, you do have to take a decision early as to how you want to design your product to be compliant uh, from day one. 
uh, it's not easy, uh, but I think it's probably something which will bring you closer to your end game. I would say education is really important and getting the word out to teach investors as well as crypto participants about best practices um, and to understand that, um, that digital assets uh, are not always the, how do you say it, they're, they're, they, basically there needs to be investor protection there and you're not going to make a million dollars off of everything. Um, and you need to know that there's a downside as well as an upside and be very, very mindful of that. So uh, investor education, both on the side of the regulators and from the market will be key for the future growth. I'm sorry. What are the, what would, what, what recommendations for, um, the one, uh, one piece of advice for, for entrepreneurs. Um, get, get involved in some capacity and <laughs> just get started. Download a, a wallet and really start experimenting because once you step into the world of, of crypto and tokens, you, you kind of never leave. All right, I think we're uh, finishing now and thank you very much to our panelists. Please give a round of applause. Thank you. It's a, it was the first uh, conversation taking place in, in Abu Dhabi for Finiverse Arabia, but we will have another great a few panels coming soon. Thank you very much again. Thank you Thank for being you. a great moderator, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give a big hand to our amazing panelists. I really, I really appreciate sharing your great insights. And by the way, definitely coming out of uh, crypto winter, one of the things we can say after a couple of bad players in the market, all of the mishaps that happened, we kind of feel that it's really like a blessing in disguise. Thank you so much, Y, for sharing your insights. And thank you, EDGM, for joining us. Definitely right now, crypto uh, projects are more willing to be regulated. In the past, we wouldn't see that. Right now, we definitely see that they want, they want to be compliant. Let's talk about more. By the way, everyone who's here, definitely you'll be excited about our next fireside chat. Please. Take your seat and welcome on the stage our moderator, Angie Lau, editor-in-chief and founder at, founder at Forecast Labs. Please give her, give her a big hand. Louder. She will have an exciting fireside chat with Binance. She will be joined today by Dominic Longmang, senior executor, executive officer, Binance Abu Dhabi Limited. Give them a big hand, please. So, exploring opportunities in the region. What do Web3 companies need to know? And how is Abu Dhabi Binance, Binance Abu Dhabi forging forward? Please be attentive. Angie, the floor is yours. Much, Maria. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is really exciting to be here in Abu Dhabi and really to experience UAE in person for really the very first time. I've been... Uh, a founder and an entrepreneur for really a short period of my longer career as a global journalist. And one thing holds to be true for me is that there are stories to be told around the world in the most, uh, sometimes the most um, unobvious places. And it is up to us and our responsibility as citizens, as participants, to really learn more. And so Dominic Longman, SEO of Binance Abu Dhabi, excited and thrilled to be here to help communicate this desire of all of us to understand this region a little bit more. You've been here for quite a while. Uh, well, firstly, thank you for having me. It's a great honor to be here. Um, I've been lucky enough to be in this region on and off now since about 2015. So, uh, yep, quite a while. Um, came here originally to work for one of the government, large government entities here, and then um, uh, set up some blockchain strategy there, and then decided to uh, really take a leap 2017 and, and set up my first digital asset custodian. Back then, the right place to do it, I think it was Shoreditch, that was back in London, that was this place that was kicking off. And it's probably an example of where maybe a country didn't quite grab an opportunity it had. Um, we kept coming here actually a number of times to, to, with our companies to then look to the regulation because what we, was here, of course, from 2018 
was great regulation we can work with. In the UK, it was very difficult. We didn't really know our position. We didn't know, you know where we would be. We always wanted to be a regulated custodian. So, um, and then, you know, left that firm, went to another one, set up another custodian again in the UK, brought that here, that was looking for funding, and then COVID struck. So, got stuck in the UK, and then was very lucky enough uh, to be asked to join Binance Abu Dhabi in uh, June last year. I think as a decentralized industry, we are very... Uh, we are very familiar with this poetic comparison to the nomadic life as digital founders and entrepreneurs and, and really industry leaders to forge forward wherever the opportunities are. What are the opportunities here from your perspective as a crypto veteran, but also on behalf of Binance Abu Dhabi? Um, I, mean, it, I think you probably heard it in numerous panels and talks. It really does come from the top. You know, the, the government here has had the foresight to look at its, its situation. And not just the government here, but also the region has looked at, right, so we need to move away from petrochemical dependency, right? We need to look at other opportunities. And because of some of the political situation here, they can look long term. They can go strategy 5, 10, 15 years, have the foresight, as I say, and, you know, as mentioned in the previous panel. They were doing a, a, the, an incredibly strong regulatory framework where it was launched in 2018, so they were already looking at it 2016, 2017, right? Um, so you've got a government that's focused on building out new industry, adding many millions of people to its uh, economy and growing and nurturing new businesses. It's, you've got regulators both here, you've got obviously the established framework, you've got VARA who's you know, somewhat newer, but is, you know, there's an opportunity to really work with a regulator that's also looking at being progressive. And even Russell Kamer, just a little bit further up the road, is launching itself, trying to be a, you know, a hub for those smaller companies, et cetera, growing into utilizing blockchain. Because I think they've all appreciated that you know, blockchain uh, adoption, uh, businesses, will be a marker of your economic growth in the future. So, sorry. It's, it's a mark for, for growth in the future, and there is a very strong regulatory perspective that is that tailwind for, for that type of growth. How important is it to have that strong regulatory landscape that is cohesive, as Lucy uh, in our last panel um, uh, really accurately stated, to have that kind of comprehensive outlook to welcome uh, firms and founders from the Web3 space? I, I think it's, it's, it's critical from numerous factors. Firstly, you know, we uh, are first achieved our, our custody license back in November. And with custody being such an important part of the industry, right? You know, private keys, securing them, securing your client's assets, that needs to be against the, the strongest regulation and supervision you know, possible. So you, you have that piece um, from uh, ADGM. And then as you expand that out, the, the regulation means I know what I'm operating against. So as a business owner, you know, I know the type of people as an individual I need to have. I know my, you know, what is expected to occur. The worst thing is when you don't know, when there's lack of clarity. Um, let's say back 2016, 2017 as a startup, we're going to spend a lot of our money looking uh, with, with consultants, etc., just trying to understand the regulatory framework. Here, you know, it's absolutely defined. But also at the same time as a regulator, they are looking constantly to the future, and they, it really is a very open relationship. We can have great discussions and work together on what needs to happen next. The perception is everything, and the ability for you to function as a responsible corporate citizen here within the aspects and the confines of this region here. Elsewhere, it's a little bit more tense and uh, adversarial, uh, I think is, is the right word. Uh, in the United States, the perception is very, very different, not only uh, on Binance specifically, but against a lot of peers in the industry. How does Binance, as, as you know, amongst your colleagues from a global perspective, viewing the regulatory disparity globally and then strategically, where are you focusing or starting to focus and pay attention from a business strategy viewpoint? 
So, you know, we are, you know, I think it's been in the press many times, you know, the most regulated right now. And, you know, we have, I think, last count, 19 plus from New Zealand, Spain, etc. Obviously, we'll have Mikey coming through. And it's not just about, you know, getting a license, it's operating, being supervised, being monitored in those particular jurisdictions. And rather than sort of a global strategy, I say right now, you know, I'm focused on Abu Dhabi. We have Alex up in Dubai. We have uh, people in Bahrain. We're focused on the local jurisdiction and working locally to build that out. As you know, we don't operate a global HQ. We're a, decentra- we're a firm in a decentralized industry, and we operate somewhat in that way from a, a strategy perspective at, at that point. So, you know, we're focused all around the world at the moment. And you're right, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, I think, for the industry that some regulators maybe are taking a more adversary approach that's probably, you know, um, not achieving what they should really hope to achieve in the long run, right? Give us some insights as to this region and why the warm reception and interest and uh, intellectual interest in Web3 and in decentralized fi- uh, in de- decentralized innovation? Uh, one, it's an, an incredible reception. Um, you know, they really did, I think, recognize, you know, it is technico- technology innovation. It's all aspects of it. You know, blockchain and Web3 have got a huge focus because it is very new and there's a new opportunity there and that will hopefully lead to some incredible growth. Um, it is um, amazing that they've had that foresight and even like, you know, uh, yesterday, uh, ADGM's expansion, you know, is, is huge. It's now taking over another island, Abu Dhabi. It's going to be possibly one of the biggest finance, finance centers globally in the future. You know, to be part of that, you know, it really aligns with our strategy. We, we're about, you know, building kind of the cities or the ecosystems of the future to support all of this and to have it from not just, you know, ac- accelerators for small startups, but through to activities like Hub71, which is doing uh, focusing more on kind of Series B, Series C to bring those kind of companies in here is is amazing. Obviously, you know, over a period of time, it's taken change. There's been a move away to allow more local ownership, more people coming here to own direct. Obviously, with ADGM as well, you're under English common law, which is a great win for us coming from abroad. It's much easier for us to operate and understand where we are and be against English courts, etc. Um, critical for virtual assets because most courts and jurisdictions globally don't recognize them from a legal perspective, uh, which is a, a topic for regarding, say, FTX and companies going bust and where are my assets? And it's great to have that capability here as well. So they have covered, in a way, all the bases. That's, that's actually a really interesting insight and nuance to how this region is uh, engaging with the rest of the world, to have that standard not only in language, but to have corporate similar language and a familiar legal framework in order to really feel secure in doing the kind of common business here is really important. For ecosystem founders, for developers, for, for entrepreneurs, for startups, Looking in this region right now, what are the important nuances to understand to help navigate the space as they look to explore growth here? Um, I hope it's changing. I know certainly, as you know, having been you know uh, in parts by the world, is sometimes it can, you know people are looking this way as some sort of easy investment opportunity. Yes, I think we all are aware there's a huge amount of capital, and in fact, us who you know, sort of have lived here for some time, so probably it's some of the toughest capital to actually get um, because it is incredibly in smart investors here. Um, that's sometimes a misnomer. Now, that doesn't mean it's, it's it, you know, that it's some kind of closed shop or anything. It's absolutely not at all. But don't come in here with some level of sort of naivety or think it's just going to be, you know, I turn up and because I'm coming from XYZ. You know, come in here with a great business proposition, a proposition that's going to add value to the, uh, the region and the country that's going to grow uh, the ecosystem and, and grow the country, then absolutely you know, it'll be a, it should be coming here with that mindset um, because I think that will be really appreciated by those who are already here. When you look at the landscape in terms of uh, global finance, how does decentralized finance, crypto, NFTs, and this blockchain technology underlayer for the future of a digital global economy 
how does this how is this region evolving where do you think it is in the chapter of the final evolution yeah crikey i think we're still very early days i think there's a huge opportunity um because you know the industry itself is really as a start point we've been talking about crypto as a new asset class well actually you know the multiple tokens that are out there are representing many different things i Call out John, for example, who's in the audience here with the currency, who's been in the region now for, for many more years, right? You know, the underlying technology is being start to being understood and therefore utilized as the next rails for securities, for bonds, right? There's numerous plays going on. It's still incredibly early days. But, you know, instead of that occurring elsewhere, we're seeing more of the core infrastructure players becoming here. You know, they realize that, you know, the, the the, the, the sort of political stability, the you know, financial situation here compared to the rest of the world from a, a global macro perspective is far more conducive to doing business. The travel, the opportunity here, you know, it's, it really is a, a growth place for that to occur. And we're seeing far more and more of that turning up, you know, and uh, another B firm that's just turned up in our building, Brabant Howard, right? They, a company like that doesn't make a decision lightly to come to a financial center like this and they're making a significant commitment so again all of the the relevant tradfi players when firms like that start looking here are actually really looking to come into the region as well so it really is going to become that amazing hopefully environment to see how the next usage of of DeFi, crypto etc is used alongside traditional assets in fact I'd like to, in a way, get rid of the term crypto and, and look at it as these are financial assets, significant. I mean, there are absolutely other use cases for blockchain in the world. Um, and we should be all seen across in that, that space. It's, it's somewhat going from TradFi, DeFi. I think you have uh, a really incredibly unique experience and wealth of knowledge to share in that clearly as a global participant in traditional finance and then to make the leap into crypto, um, even before so many people did, and to really integrate that previous experience and bring it into this new world, and to do it in the region of the world that most people are very unfamiliar with. Where do you see the trajectory of this industry? What keeps you up at night? What excites you? Let's start with what excites you and then maybe yeah. what keeps you up at night. Okay, so uh, from the exciting side, and this will be, I suppose, my opinion and what I've worked on for many years um, outside of, say, Binance specifically is, you know, the decentralized nature. And you know, I would argue most chains or whatever have still got a way to go, become the full, fully decentralized in a way. Can mitigate significant geopolitical risks globally. This could be more of a, a level playing field for many different countries. I think you know, the previous panel talked about you know, the disparity between many different countries and where they are and the access to financial products that they have. You know, this, and I think you know, I'm not the only one here, right? We've all come, a number of us come into this space because we really think that can happen. And we are really still at you know, one minute past, or you know, I, I, there is a huge amount to go. There is a lot of work going on. I'm lucky enough to be part of one of the biggest players in the, in the market right now to start looking at some of these things. But, you know, for me, I, I see a, a future which is a completely different way where all of our assets are, in effect, recorded on chain. Um, and we, you know, via our wallets, or, you know, everything we own, we could be using to pay for, trade with, etc. So, you know, that's exciting. I think what keeps me, uh, you know, worries me is, we have been at a market cap of say a trillion dollars right now. Yeah, we've absorbed some impact from, you know, bad industry players over the past few years, or just industry players who probably weren't actually that as knowledgeable as they thought, and and just made some basic mistakes. Right. Um, what I want to see us do better is actually work together in the competing entities to 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 move the message on, instead of uh, you know having a lot of the fud that continues to occur. You know, even a couple of days ago when the Bitcoin network was having a little bit of an issue, right? There was all kind of questions. Oh, my God, panic. You know, X, Y, Z is occurring. And actually, you know, it's just an, a bit of a network issue. And those things slow us down. 
There's another uh, network issue, and that is uh, uh, kind of a consistency of, of leadership, at least what we're seeing in some parts of the world. Here, it feels like there is a very defined sense of where it wants to go. Why is, why do you suppose as someone from a global perspective that is, and directionally, where is this region going? So, so why, do you, why do you think there is such bifurcation at the moment? Um, I mean, going back to the first part of the question, why is that here? I think, you know, a lot of, of the nationals here, am I right here? You know, you've got to remember this is a, what are we now, 51, 52-year-old country, 1971, so 52, right? Um, 51. They are, you know, just a number of generations away from when it grew. And Sheikh Zayed built a mindset of growing the country, investing in its people, and they continue to do that and want to continue to build that out. You have, you know, uh, you'll see obviously a, a, in this building today, a, a Emirati groups, the you know, ADGM framework, and then moving to the Ministry of Economy. And the, you've got people there throughout who are living, not just to, you know, get reelected, they're able to focus 5, 10, 15 years ahead with a clear pressure that they know that they have been incredibly successful based on some of the resources they have, but now they need to diversify. So that gives them some clarity of thought to actually operate and focus and support businesses like this coming that way. And they have incredible ambitions. You know, um, it, it's very exciting to be part of a country which wants to do so many different things try you know and uh, address so many different areas of its economy it's incredibly exciting and i think that's the you know it's got the capital it's got the mindset it's got some very well educated people it's got the ability to bring lots of people here as well it's got a great geographic location i'm sounding a bit like a salesman for Abu Dhabi, but well are you ready to you welcome know. your peers and your competition you've got yeah uh, brian armstrong uh, over at coinbase here uh, at the UAE this week, uh, you've got uh, Brad Garlinghouse of Ripple, also here in the UAE. Michael from Fireblocks is here tomorrow. Yeah, absolutely. They're they're all coming. You totally. ready to you ready to help them navigate? Absolutely. Again, because we we need that, right? We need that as an ecosystem. It drives people. That's going to drive better competition. You know, that gives career progression for people as they move through the industry. You know, which will then accelerate more and more people coming in. You know. You've got you know, great work here, ADGM Academy, with its digital assets program. They've had development programs here for, to, to get coding, you know, the core people we need. But we need those other names here to, again, build out their ecosystem. So it's, it's brilliant news. More than welcome to have them here. What is the ultimate motivation to participate in the future of global finance from a digital perspective from this region? Um, because... I, you know, if you look at the region as a whole, they are seeing themselves really come up to be, you know, uh, uh, move up the, the ladder to be an absolute level playing field with, with some of the other economies out there. And so for them, that, this is that opportunity to make that happen. Dominic, a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, audience. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for this insightful conversation. Uh, we are moving forward and let's explore more the intersection of fintech, virtual assets and Web3. We're so excited to have on the stage Annabelle Juan, managing partner at Amber Group. Please welcome her on stage. Be louder, please. Give her a big hand. Our next panelist, please welcome on stage Igor Passin, founder and CEO at Daxi. Give a big hand. Be louder. Welcome, Vincent Chalk, CEO at First Digital Trust. Be louder, give him a big hand. Our next panel will be moderated and please welcome her on stage, Annie Hui, CEO and co-founder at Castanomy. Annie, the floor is yours. So good afternoon and welcome to our sessions on exploring the intersection of fintech, virtual assets and web3. 
So today we are very happy that we have distinguished panel from different areas and to share the views and also the perspective on all these three areas, how they are converging and shaping the future of the finance. So before we dive into topics, maybe we can give a minute for all of us to introduce ourselves and our background. So let me begin first. Okay, so I myself is Annie, COO of Castronomy, which we provide a um, web-free infrastructure solutions for enterprise, basically wallet as a service. Um, so how about Vincent? Hi, um, I'm Vincent Chalk. I'm CEO of First Digital Trust. We are a licensed trust company custodian based out of Hong Kong, focused on mainly digital asset clients and Web3 with regarding to trust, custody, and structuring. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Annabelle Huang. I'm a managing partner at Amber Group. Uh, we provide crypto market making and asset management services uh, for institutional and high net worth investors globally. We started about five years ago in Hong Kong and now have expanded across Asia and North America as well and exploring opportunities in the Middle East. So it's great to be here with everybody. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Right. Igor, um, uh, yeah, I represent my company Dex, a digital nail bank based out of United States, and we open USD accounts in the US bank for international clients and connected to it digital assets accounts, uh, blockchain enabled payments, um, and related DeFi services. So, thank you, Vincent, Annabelle, and Igor. Um, so, as we all know, the Web3 and the virtual asset is transforming the way that how we think about money, value, as well as the ownership. So FinTech is always at the forefront of the whole transformation. And actually all these rapid innovations always bring in a lot of different challenges like the regulatory, um, uncertainty, the security considerations, risk, and even the ethical considerations, right? So as we navigate and into this uh, landscape, it is very crucial for us to strike out a balance between innovation and responsibility. So there is always a one question that was being asked or being raised is how we should, uh, how we should, what approach that we should take in order to adopt the new technologies. So should we doubling down it uh, on innovation and push to the boundaries? Um, or should we proceed with a greater caution and um, prioritize the safety and stability? So, Iga, I know that you are doing a business between um, crossover or between, between the TradFi and the DeFi, right? So, I'm sure that you should have a, share, a, a, view, a viewpoint on this one. So, can you share with us on this? Uh, yes, sure. So, uh, from my point of view, blockchain technology and generally digital assets, crypto industry, in terms of development of tech is much far ahead than safety, security, compliance. And I think that the whole industry should focus mainly on customer protection, uh, insurance for them, uh, compliance with banking law, with financial regulations, simplicity, usability. So I think that generally adoption of crypto, of digital assets, of Web3 is not where it should be, mainly because most of companies, they don't care about the basics. And basics are how you protect your customers' assets and how you control your business internally. So all these events that happened last year, many people mentioned FTX, but actually FTX is one of dozens of companies who failed. And I think this is the problem because people, they don't trust crypto. They don't trust crypto because many people lost money in really big established companies. FTX, Genesis, Gemini, Urn, uh, Vault in Singapore, BlockFi, dozens of them. And this is the problem. And this is not technology problem. So, and failure of, this com of these companies, bankruptcies of these companies, are only because there is no compliance, there is no customer protection, there is no like rules in the industry, and that is why I'm totally supporting uh, regulators when they come into the industry. I 
think that the industry should be regulated, even I am being like entrepreneur, and this is like a lot of uh, challenges that I face, but I think that uh, the industry should change from this angle, not from technology. Technology is here, and actually technology have been here for since, I guess, 2020. So it was like a development stage since 2015, 2016 till 2020. Now it's stable. Tipping point is already reached like three, four years ago. So, yeah, so um, I think that TradFi should meet DeFi or CFI should meet DeFi. Basically, we have many benefits from the traditional finance uh, trust. Even, by the way, so many people tell me that, look, TradFi is not safe. Look at uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And it's like, hundred plus billion dollar bank and it failed. I agree, it can fail. But at the same time, all the customers, they get their money back because there are rules and the government and the insurance companies. So uh, when it was failure like Thursday and on Monday, money were available for the clients. This is customer protection. This is real financial regulation. FTX failed and let's say, I don't know, uh, BlockFi. So BlockFi failed like a year ago. Money are not available yet, and they will not be available. This is the difference between CFA, like uh, crypto and traditional finan financial sector. So this should be like should be going together. Yes, thanks very much, Ego. I totally agree. Actually, all this problem is not just happening to new innovation. It's actually repeating the history. So you bring a very good topics about the compliance. So actually. Um, Another important topic that everybody also wants to address today is actually how we can balance the success of all this innovation with the need for safety and regulations in this fast-growing fintech landscape. And so um, from my point of view, actually the right balance between regulation and inno innovation is actually very important. And so Vincent, um, I know that you are as a provider of custody service. Your business is, is a heavily regulated business and you always need to face a lot of compliance issues. Okay, so um, can you sh do you think that the regulation actually can keep pace with the innovation? And is there any potential gaps or challenge that we need to address? We really love to hear your views. Okay, thank you. I think the regulation and just technology Web3 companies really need to work together. So this morning we, you know, we visited the ADGM's office and we really heard a lot about how they embrace the fact that they can have an open door policy, have their licensees or applicants directly have communications with them. So I use the analogies um, that regulators are like your parents. If they do not have that, you know, share communication, have the ability for you to reach out, how would Web3 companies or companies understand what compliance is? You know, you're not born to be a good adult. You don't know what's right and what's wrong unless you have the ability or the vehicles and the tools to understand that. So there's a give and take between the two entities. And for me, you know, I, I think the regulators is a very simple objective. You know, we hear a lot about protection, about internal controls, best practices. When it comes down to this, regulators do not want their licensees' clients to lose money. They do not want their clients to be able to use money for hurting people. They do not want the companies to hurt people by allowing them to lose their money. So it's all about losing people's assets. It's about having the ability to allow companies to be able to cheat or to pre provide, prevent fraud or, or, again, hurting people. So if you put it down to the basis, what is compliance? You put tools together and, you know, for, for us as a trustee, it's also it's all about asset protection because we hold people's lifelong you know work houses gold you know all of the things that they feel valuable so that when one day they retire those assets are still there but they want to grow that so in you know my case is really important that you work with regulators that understand that they're not there to hinder the growth of the company but to help 
the company understand what is regulation? How do I put investor protection together? How do I comply with the rules and regulation that is put forward for the objective of protecting the clients, protecting the society community from uh, losing those assets? Yes, totally agree. Transparency is very important, right? So, no matter being a technology provider or even a, a customer or even from the regulator, always providing more information for the public, for all of the stakeholders to understand what we should do, we shouldn't do. That is very important. And understand that different countries actually also have different regulations. It must be a tough job, <laughs> you understand, or? Okay. It's the only so, job I know, actually. <laughs> So we need to join more tour and understand more, right? Yeah. So, um, so Annabelle, as a, a leading player in the blockchain and the cryptocurrency industry, I'm sure that you have heard a lot, see a lot, right? So I'm, I'm sure that the audience is also want to hear your views and to understand maybe, do you give us some tips on what will be the challenge and opportunities that you see in the coming three to five years? in terms of all this fintech, virtual assets, and web free area? Yeah, I guess I would speak to web three and virtual assets, uh, just because that's where I spend most of my time in. And I think before we dive into maybe looking ahead for the next three to five years, I just wanted to quickly recap where we've been in the last five years. Um, and, um, and I think a lot of the challenges actually remain the same. So the bottlenecks to mass adoption, to user onboarding, has been um, lack of trusted platforms, whether it is centralized platforms or decentralized platforms for different reasons, and also lack of user-friendly um, UI UX. Um, and that, that was the case five years ago. I remember um, trying to buy my first Bitcoin or Ethereum on chain. It was extremely difficult trying to set up my own wallet and arguably today, if you're trying to use a ledger or a MetaMask for the first time, the experience has been better, but hasn't changed much. Recently, I've had to try to code some Solidity smart contract to recover some funds. That's difficult to do for an everyday user. Um, and that's really where Amber came in five years ago, trying to bridge um, a lot of the Web2 experiences, the traditional finance experiences to Web3, to virtual asset. And, and be a trusted counterparty to a lot of the people who want to get into crypto um, or buy their first token in the first place. Um, so, and we have to shoulder a lot of the technical uh, side of the work, uh, but more so importantly, it's actually on the regulatory and the compliance front. Uh, we want to serve as a global, client, uh, a global audience, but we also had to uh, really figure out what needs to be done in, to be compliant in each jurisdiction. Um, so in that case, it's been a long five years. Uh, I would say we've come a long way as well. Five years ago, I think the previous uh, panel um, mentioned that ADGM had just started um, in Hong Kong, Singapore, there, there wasn't any comprehensive framework yet. So today that has changed um, and, we, and we've been involved in most of these conversations. So we, um, are looking into the um, new Hong Kong VASP uh, license framework. Uh, we were licensed um, under the Japan JFSA. Uh, we've been working with MAS. We just recently acquired a um, Singapore-based um, MAS license, full license holder. So, and, and also been in talks with VARA and ADGM here. So um, we have to shoulder a lot of that responsibility to bring a seamless experience to the end user. Uh, but that's, that's ha that has been a lot of the challenges uh, for us as service providers, um, and, and also I can see for the users. Um, but, but looking ahead, I think that the challenges remain uh, pretty much the same, uh, but it's a bit more nuanced, and we're making progress, we're chipping away, and, that, and I think a lot of the opportunity is also lies in solving a lot of that. Um, from a tech perspective, I think um, we are also seeing a lot of new ways um, that are uh, even developing on chain um, that are addressing a lot of these UI UX issues, uh, account abstraction, which is a new, new thing coming up that's making uh, wall experience onboarding much easier, um, a lot of the modular or scalability 
um, technology, you know, ZK or rollups that are being developed are making the underlying tech a lot easier, uh, faster, cheaper to use for, for the users. Um, and, and I think on, on the compliance side, right, then that's really up to everybody uh, in the industry and are working with the regulators to figure out a clearer path forward. We've seen a digression, you know, between the U.S. and maybe the rest of the world, and um, so that remains to, to be seen what, what really happens in the next three to five years. But I think the opportunities are keep chipping away at these very, very fundamental challenges, um, so that we can actually achieve mass adoption. Um, but I'll, I'll open the floor to the to the panelists to, to yeah. chime in as well. I can I can come on tonight if you want. So, Go ahead, um, ahead. So first of all, I agree with the projection. So for the last three, four years, nothing really changed. So, uh, so Annabelle is right. So when I remember like crypto exchanges or crypto wallets three, four years ago, it is still the same and it's not user friendly. So and for mass adoption, it, you really need to make it as simple as Web2 applications like uh, I don't know, Apple Pay or Venmo or whatever, like who depends on the market who uses. So. Simplicity, convenience, number one. Uh, from the technology standpoint, so probably crypto needs to have acquire, like uh, acquiring payments infrastructure. So basically, you use your Apple Pay or similar. You go to any 7-Eleven or restaurant, and you can pay with whatever stable coins. Or this is needed for mass adoption. So people need to think about crypto as money. So today, people think about crypto as investment tool, yeah, speculation, like uh, paper coins and all this, this is what people are talking about. They don't talk about like that I can go and pay, pay for my taxi. So this is needed for mass adoption. So people think about crypto as money because this is money that was designed for as being like a mean of payment. Um, international angle, for sure. So right now, all the like there are like apps for Singapore, there are apps for Dubai, there are apps for Abu Dhabi, United States. So users, uh, crypto is global thing, right? So if there is like great app in the United States and I am based in Estonia or um, here in Dubai, I should be able to open account in this, within this app and use it. And uh, so it's about global accessibility, global like usage of these apps. Otherwise, we are still getting the same as traditional banking. Um, so technology-wise, probably makes sense to add here that um, automated customer support with all these chat GPT AI things, for sure, this is coming into like, uh, for a blockchain, again, so I think blockchain is really developed. Um, nothing here, so I would expect. DeFi, for sure. So DeFi is a really great thing. So why DeFi is generally possible? There are different economies in the world. Like There are like developing economies, Philippines, India. There are developed economies, uh, United States. Or they have different financial rates. They have different demand for lending products, for investment products. With DeFi, you connect people from different countries and you can provide different products. So I believe that DeFi can solve this accessibility of different financial products. And this will drive like connectivity between people, interest rates, uh, loans available, let's say in Africa. If I am in the United States and I get in the bank like 1% uh, uh, interest rate, then I can lend my money somewhere in Africa and uh, if they need my money and get like back whatever 10 15 percent so many use cases in this like banking on crypto rails or banking on digital assets so I guess the reason why um, what our friends on the panel here are saying is crypto is really a disruptor due to the fact that it's in the overall economy crypto is a very tiny part of the global market cap. But why is it generating so much attention? Why is so many regulators really pinpointing and, and targeting digital assets? Because it's a transfer of value instantly through the blockchain. And that's a scary thing for a lot of, for especially banks, 
governments because the, the inability of having that transparency, they don't know where people are moving values and assets around, as well as the inability to tax those. So um, why is crypto and Web3 such a huge potential for our future is because everybody has heard the word of unbanked. There's a lot of countries that have people that are not going to be wanted in the system, meaning you know we have reporting obligations like common reporting standards, where it, the average cost to report one person for a financial institution is up to $1,200 US. So imagine if a financial institution that has to report thousands of clients. So that's why banks have been offloading clients that has small balances in their bank account because it's just not worth it for them to pay those types of fees and to keep those clients around. So even people that has average jobs, minimum wage jobs, may not be able to have bank accounts anymore. And yet they live in developed countries, they live in big cities, but just because they earn minimum wage, banks don't want them. So this is another reason why crypto is a disruptor because it solves those questions and those issues. So totally agree. Actually, that new technology actually really play a role in the whole market, in the whole landscape, right? We have different use case. I think no matter the mainstream or even the users, actually everybody is improving and trying to find a new use case opportunity in this area. And I think not just the industry, but also the regulators, they're also learning a lot right now. And uh, I think maybe Vincent, you can also share a little bit more on how you're dealing with those regulators, how, how, how you interact with those regulators to make sure that the business that you want to, the innovative business that you want to do, can really do it in, in your innovative way. Well, dealing with regulators could be a challenging and, and, and tricky thing because um, like Hong Kong, there are different regulators for different activities. So SFC regulates securities and futures exchange. HKMA is for banks, monetary movements. Uh, we have also regulators for insurance. So they, they are separated. They're, it's not like Singapore where there's one MAS regulators. So when you conduct different activities, you gotta be careful not to overstep into the other regulators sort of uh, areas of uh, regulation. But almost the same, we've talked to VARA, we've talked to ADGM, and they have different activities. But in what we do, there's a lot of crossovers because custody means that we are a title holder and means that we do not do anything with the assets without instructions. So when our clients instruct us to do anything with the assets, that could be deemed as a broker dealer, right? So that's another set of license. So it's, it's challenging because we have to actually not seem like we're trying to educate the regulators, but to work together to come up with a proper platform that makes it, makes it, makes it available that the, 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 the licensees can actually achieve the full board of activities without actually needing to break the other, you know, like uh, uh, dealing securities without licensing. But yet you're still licensed under the same regulators, right? Right, right. So those are challenges, I think. Yes, and um, most of the time, actually, when we hearing that is um, the mainstream, sometimes they have a resistance on taking this new technology is because they always think that this is something that they will make them lose some of their market shares and make them to lose some of business. But actually, when we think about that, um, companies like banking or even the financial or the traditional financial institution, they should take this opportunity to embrace it and then to utilize it to extend some things that they cannot do in the past. Maybe there is a possibility that they can do using a new technology. So Annabelle, do you have any, um, in, the, in, in your experience, can you uh, also provide us some very significant use case that you see actually the new technologies is helping all this traditional market to do some things that is even more useful, even more innovative to the public, yeah. I think one thing that's um, actually quite topical right now, obviously with the rise of AI, then the question is how do you verify that you're human and Stan Ullman is working on the WorldCoin initiative and it's sort of similar to decentralized ID and 
proof of humanhood, right? And they just launched the app, and they will launch also the, um, the the token soon. And it is not really a crypto play as conventionally um, conveyed, but it's actually using the underlying um, technology, the blockchain technology, um, and and using in in a way that you know it's NFT, it's DID, and prove that that you're human and. And that's also at intersection of both fintech and, I guess, Web3 in general, right? So if you're looking ahead to the future, what kind of world do we live in if we actually are interacting a lot in the metaverse, um, then WorldCoin is actually a way to prove that, that we are human. And, um, and there could be so many attributes that are, uh, that are unique to us being represented here. And that's not the only project that's working on this. Um, so at Amber, we also have a venture arm that invests in early stage Web3 projects. So we invest across a few DSOC projects, so decentralized um, social. Um, so that's working on social graphs, on um, social um, applications in, in general um, that also aim to uh, aim at mass adoption. Um, so these things, um, they're, they're not really um, aimed towards financial gain, gains which is why I think regulators might view it differently. It might be an easier conversation to have with them, and it will have um, actual real-world use cases down the line um, that is based on the blockchain technology. So something like that, or even you know, sort of um, blockchain-based gaming or, or, or um, any other, or blockchain-based education, things like that could be um, interesting down the line and doesn't have to be crypto trading or speculation related. Yeah, and, I, and I'm also always thinking that maybe it can apply to a lot of NGO when they're doing charities or even some education platform that, you know, to keep track a lot of all these students from the very young age, what they have learned, and then even using what their learning skills to continue to earn or something like that. Yeah, it's very interesting. So um, talking about all these new technologies, so Igor, you also mentioned that actually the technologies uh, that's not a problem. Uh, we should embrace it. But um, at the same time, I also want to know if you, when you're trying to adopt a new technology, okay, um, how you balance this, the risk and the reward of these technologies into your business model? Um, yeah, so there are many technologies. The most important is to use it for the benefits of customers. When I see like now many companies generally, many startups, they say they use blockchain, but they have no idea why they do it, or AI. Actually, blockchain is just a ledger. It's like a database or whatever. Transactions, customers, doesn't matter. And not necessarily you need it for many use cases. Same about AI. AI is just, you know, like, a, like a principles, mechanics, how you work with data. And not necessarily you need AI, for example, you know, like f to create chatbot, let's say for, you know, like customer support, you, you know, like it's not AI, it's just database of like FAQ questions sometimes. So um, technology is good thing, but you need to use it specifically for clients needs, not to convince your investors that you are the most advanced company, right? And to say on the pitch deck that you have AI, blockchain, but for the benefits. So blockchain, I mean, digital assets, cryptocurrency, the use case which I see, like clear use case, is moving assets across border. And this is much better than SWIFT, let's say, or traditional banking like payment rails. Faster, safer, cheaper. This is, for example, use case. Um, AI can be used for to analyze like open banking data, for example, to give some financial advices, insights to the clients. I didn't see like uh, great use cases, but this is what uh, can be used in the fintech. So there are a lot of data about, from clients, and you can analyze it, you can process it, and to give them some recommendations based on it. Um, so. From my point of view, customer is always first, technology is second, not vice versa. This is the main point. So thinking about pains uh, of the clients, finding solutions using technology, this is, the, should, this is how I, at least I approach 
uh, create on the product. Okay, so I think um, come to the end of this uh, sessions. Maybe um, the last question is: um, Do you have any advice to the audience here? If they, no matter they're in a fintech or they want to pursue in the virtual asset or the new technologies areas, so what would be your advice for them if they want to go into this industry, and how you will suggest them to um, combine all these three things together? Yeah, so Vincent, do you have any suggestions to those people who are interested in this area? I think my advice is really to look at what you're building. Is it going to enhance the value of your customers? Is it going to improve society? You know, um, or is it just something you want to build to raise capital? And, but um, I think whoever wants to come into this industry, for to, to stay and to operate long term, you got to look at the substance. You got to look at, and, and the last panel said as well, right? Educate, be compliant, reverse, sort of deconstruct it. Um, think about your company being taken over by a larger company and what would the data room needs to look like. So construct everything in a way that it has to be fully compliant. So, how about Annabelle? I would say that um, even though I guess this industry seems super fast paced and a lot of people are probably coming in and out, right? there's huge turnover, but um, really think long term um, and, and I think that'll change the perspective on a lot of the things. Um, yes, things evolve very quickly, which is why there are a lot of challenges and opportunities, but if you take a longer term view, you're able to really kind of filter out, weed out a lot of the noise. Um, I mean, those of us who, who've been around for a while, right, we are the ones who are committed to, to, a, um, to solving a, a pain point. To solve, um, we're building for a cause and we're here for the long term. And, um, you know, you're going to see the volatility in the market all the time. But um, I think it, it is a very dynamically kind of up cycle and just don't lose sight of that. How about Eko? Um, yes, so I think I, I can relate. So we should bring to customers uh, products with, which are more reliable, trustful, easier to use, convenient. Same as we use every day, like Instagram, TikTok, I don't know, who, um, uh, Uber. Uh, this is, should be how Web3 products should look like. They should be convenient and simple. And at the same time, you can trust them. You, can, you give them your the most valuable assets, money, right? So they should be trustful. So I think it, sh it can be solved by bringing some experience, best experience of Web2, of traditional finance into crypto, into Web3, and to rely on the previous experience. It's not something, you know, like bad. It is good. We just need to bring it into the new world. That's it. Yeah, I, I also totally agree with our view, um, point, viewpoint. Um, nowadays, actually, everybody, you know, a lot of technology is open source, you can use it. And I think who could really find the best use case, it's not just from a technology point of view or where from the industry point of view, it's actually from a customer experience. So no matter it's Web2, Web3, FinTech or virtual asset, actually the most important is they really helping people solving the pain, bring the view values to the customers, and then it's very easy to use and have a very good experience. So. Thank you very much for today's, and uh, I hope there is more and more new opportunities that we can see in the market coming to fulfill all these values that we just talked about. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Annie. You. Please give a big hand to our amazing panelists. I totally support that crypto products should be compliant, long-term, and reliable. Thank you so much for your insights. We're moving forward to our last session for today, so please be attentive, and let's discover the power of future of virtual assets. Power in the future of virtual assets from exchanges to financial institutions. Our next panel will be moderated. Please welcome her on stage. Angelina Kwan, Managing Director at Stratford Finance. Please give her a big hand. Louder, please. Also well, welcome on stage, Toya Zhang, CMO at BIT. Give her a big hand. Please welcome on stage Talal Tabab, CEO at Coin Minak Exchange. Be louder. 
And last but not least, please give a big hand to Wing Huang, co-founder and CEO at Xrex. Be louder. Thank you. Angelina, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, hello. There we go. Hi. Can we hear each other better? Yes. Okay, good. Yay. Excellent. I hope everybody's having a great time, and I have an amazing panel today, so I'm going to have a little bit of fun with them. So I've got the honor and pleasure of introducing Toya, Wayne, and Talal. Um, and Toya is the Chief Marketing Officer of BIT, which is the exchange spin-off of Matrixport, um, a key player in Asia uh, for digital assets. Wayne is the co-founder and CEO of Xrex. Now, when I, when I heard the name Xrex, I'm like, what is Xrex? So, do you want to tell us what Xrex means? Yeah, sure. Uh, X stands for exchange. Rex is Latin for king, so king of exchanges. So, that is a cool name, and I did not know that. Thank you. Very cool. Talal, you are the CEO of CoinMina. Something about your exchange? Any fun fact? Yeah, so our name isn't as exciting. Uh, MENA is M Middle Eastern North Africa, and that's the jurisdiction we, we operate in. But we're the fastest growing crypto business in the Middle East. Excellent. So exchanges have really been leading the way in terms of products and services. And in many jurisdictions, they've been the first to get licensed. Um, or at least this is where the regulators are really looking at um, at least capturing them first. So. Products and services have also been led by exchanges. So can you tell us a bit about your exchange, some of your key products and focus? And because I'm going to have uh, Toya uh, start first, because ladies first, if that's OK. And then we'll change it to men first. So over to you, Toya. Tell us about BIT. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Angelina. Uh, also, it's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks to Finiverse Airbird Tour. Woo. Uh, Woo. So, uh, about BIT, as Angelina introduced, BIT is a spin-off of Matrixport. So Matrixport is one of the leading asset management firms, uh, starting, starting from Hong Kong and Singapore. So Matrixport, big it was our parent company and now is our sister company. So we've grown up. Uh, BIT is, uh, we call ourselves a full suite cryptocurrency exchange, but our strong suit is actually uh, crypto options trading. And crypto options trading, some of you may not be aware, like comparing to thousands of spot trading platforms and hundreds of perps trading platforms, there is probably um, only five in the market up and running with proper risk management and margin models of options trading exchange nowadays. So we are like apparently one of those five. Our target users are mostly asset management firms uh, or hedge funds or uh, treasury managers. Um, so, so those are our target audience. But at the same time, you may, you may be surprised to see that in Asia, there are many kind of advanced traders who are interested in trading options. Uh, not to speculate on the market, but really, really as in, uh, using it as a, a sophisticated tools to manage their risk uh, or, or use it as an insurance for this, for, for this market. So that's, that's where we are here. Well, I can tell you the equity options market, there's not many players, and I think this is a really growing area. So it's very, very exciting. Wayne, tell us a bit about your exchange, Xrex. Sure, what are some of the key you. products and your focus? Yeah, thank you, Angelina. Xrex uh, is a fully regulated compliant exchange with a big team in Taiwan. Uh, we're directly invested by the Taiwanese government and many of the largest uh, publicly listed bank groups in Asia. Um, today's topic is about efficiency, so we're one of the most efficient exchanges to onboard people who are completely new to crypto. We do that by working with regulators, banks, and DeFi protocols to provide the most robust and cost-efficient fiat on-off ramps uh, between fiat and crypto. Uh, we support the US dollar, but we also support many uh, local currencies, such as the Indian rupee, 
the Taiwanese dollar and um, the AED here. Wow, cool. Last but not least, Talal, tell us a bit about your exchange and what's your key products and your focus. Um, yeah, so I guess um, CoinMina, we launched about uh, two years ago. We have a unique licensing stack because we're licensed by the Central Bank of Bahrain. Um, and That's as, unusual. Yeah, so as a fiat on-ramp and off-ramp, the biggest shareholder or the biggest stakeholder that you have, sorry, are the banks, right? If you're um, looking to move money in and out, the majority of wires or the majority of value is still transferred via um, traditional banking rails. Um, and as long as that's the case, we thought that it would be prudent or be wise for us to be regulated by the same entity or the same body that regulates the banks. Because in that case, we're able to efficiently have our customers move money in and out. Um, we're also proud to be licensed by VARA, the Virtual Asset Regulatory Authority uh, that's been set up in Dubai. Um, and as the name says, Coin Mina, we're mostly focused on the Middle East region. Um, we're a mobile first, Arabic first platform. We have about 280,000 uh, verified customers um, across the Middle East. And I'd say UAE, Saudi, and um, yeah, Bahrain are our top three markets. The services that are there on Coin Mina are pretty simple so far, I'd say. Uh, it allows you to compliantly and smoothly move money from crypto to your bank or from your bank to crypto. The reality is, I don't think that's the best use case for crypto long term, but it is the Trojan horse because it solves a big problem that users have. So we onboarded a lot of users by solving this problem, but the idea is to start selling them uh, or start allowing them to use on-chain services or on-chain decentralized applications. Hey, Prince the next 1 billion users on board, the fiat on off frames. Wow. So I'm going to continue with Talal, if that's OK. In terms of your licensing, I'm going to ask both our other speakers about where they're going to or getting plans to be licensed. But Talal, you're licensed by a central bank. I've never heard a central bank licensing any exchange. How did that happen with Bahrain? Um, yeah, to be completely honest, it happened through trial and error. If, if uh, you want to like the honest answer, I set up a regulated entity in DIFC, ADGM, ESCA, Central Bank of Bahrain, Central Bank of Jordan. So we, we initiated the process with literally every regulator and we saw that the Bahraini regulator was the one that understood crypto the most. Um, and it was the same entity or the same supervisory committee that regulates the banks. So we automatically saw an opportunity because the biggest issue that crypto exchanges have is, uh, or at least, yeah, the, the non-compliant ones have AML issues, but that's a separate topic that I'll leave to, to uh, unregulated exchanges. But us regulated exchanges, the most important uh, or one of the most important uh, infrastructure pieces is your ability to have multiple bank accounts and your ability to settle uh, and clear payments because banks don't necessarily want to deal with crypto exchanges. They're, we're still classified as a high-risk industry, uh, so we thought we could reduce the risk, the perceived risk from the banking side by being regulated by the central bank. And um, yeah, we've been... There's, I think, 400 applicants to the Central Bank of Bahrain and only three licensed exchanges. Um, so it's, it's worked for us quite nicely, I'd say. Wow. Got it. Thank you on that. Wayne. Yes. What are your plans about licensing? And uh, what are your next steps? Um, or maybe you might not get licensed. What are some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of this space? Yeah, sure. Um, when we started five years ago, and we asked ourselves the question, so how do we onboard the next one billion new users into crypto? We thought, okay, we really got to solve this fiat on frame problem, right? Because people all over the world, the unbanked, um, they're going to have, they're going to need um, to get into crypto using local currencies such as Indian rupee, AED, SGD, the Taiwanese dollar. So one of the first investors that we went to was the Taiwanese government uh, because we were setting up our company in Taiwan. Um, and uh, very fortunately, uh, we got them as our, one of our first investors. 
and that really opened the door for us. So I thought, you know, looking back five years ago, uh, really happy for ourselves to have made that decision. And they also took on an observer board seat. And from there, we pitched to very big um, publicly listed banks, and we got uh, SBI, which is the largest banking group in Japan, a spin-off. SoftBank. SoftBank, yeah. SoftBank, right? Yeah. And, then, and then from there, we convinced um, the largest banking group uh, in Taiwan, one of the uh, largest by market cap of Taiwanese companies, CDIB, uh, to take on the board seat and be an, uh, an investor. And from there, we got many, many public li uh, publicly listed companies worldwide to be our investor. And so now we had a regulator-friendly cap table, right? And from there, we acquired a Canadian money service business license. Okay. We acquired four licenses throughout, the, uh, throughout Europe. And um, past two years, we were working very closely with Singapore uh, Monetary Authority of Singapore, MAS. Uh, we're almost getting the major payment institution license in Singapore, which includes the digital payment token license. Uh, and that's under the uh, Payments Act. Uh, and also under the Securities and Futures Act, uh, we filed for fiat custodial and also fund management licenses because um, we have to market make liquidity between the US dollar, US dollar stable coins, and local currencies such as AED and Indian rupees INR. So we thought it's good to prepare ourselves to have a fund management license. Got it. So you've got a bunch of licenses that you're thinking about, and we'll talk a bit about the UAE in a couple of minutes. Toya, what are the plans for licensing for bit.com? Um, as an offshore exchange, we're an offshore exchange, we registered in Seychelles and, and Cayman. So the plan, the optimal plan is we should get as many licenses as possible globally because over the years we have already realized that, that things need to get local and uh, get regulated. So, but that's not realistic because for the first reason, uh, financial reason, it's too much cost for legal and compliance in every region. And second is that not every jurisdiction is having clear framework to regulate a cryptocurrency exchange. So we need to identify what are the jurisdictions has have a friendly policy, clear policy, so it's more feasible for us to apply uh, all these licenses. So that's our approach, and that's actually the first reason that brought me to this, this region. Um, uh, I'm exploring with VARA, I'm exploring with ADGM, so how can we get us uh, regulated in, in one region. Uh, I'm also like uh, going to visit Europe for the next month, uh, going to different jurisdictions and scouts around. So after that, I'm really hoping, like this, this is me sitting here as an exchange, hoping that uh, the global communications among the regulators will, will be more open up and say, hey, this is my experience. This is what I think this is most important issue. Uh, for the cryptocurrency exchange to address in terms of protecting their users, uh, data security, you should, like, for your reference. So in that way, it's easier for us to acquire other licenses in other regions. So the title of our panel is Powering the Future of Virtual Assets um, from Exchanges to Financial Innovation. So Wayne, we, we, what are some of your plans? You talked about um, offering different products uh, and services to the unbanked. What are the killer apps that you see that you're going to be offering uh, in the future? And this is a question for all three of you. Um, what recommendations would you give to regulators to be able to deal with this financial regulation, uh, to financial innovation? Yeah. Um We've been working with regulators worldwide, and uh, we, we feel that uh, this industry is only going to achieve mass adoption. It's going to be supported by investors, institutional users, um, if we're able to be more regulated. 
And but uh, for regulators, um, I think understanding the industry and issuing our industry specific licenses is only a, maybe a quarter of the work, right? Um, there are three quarters of the work that lies in fostering a capable, knowledgeable audit industry that's able to perform both financial audits and also technical audits against uh, our industry, right? Otherwise, even if we have dedicated licenses and even if these regulators are issuing these licenses, but then it's really hard actually to provide that oversight um, if we're lacking auditors that understand, for example, how to really audit and exchanges liabilities versus assets. So I really see that as the next step that these auditors will have to achieve. And for you, Talal, what, what innovation um, are you moving into and in products and services um, and what recommendations would you make to regulators, if you could, um, about dealing with innovation? Because regulators sometimes are not known for innovation. They're usually the, the fun police, um, F-U-N police. Um, what recommendations would you give and what are some of the things that you're planning to do in terms of products and services? Fair enough. So I can give advice to regulators, and I do that very frequently. And the one that I say the most is hire younger people. Because the reality is, no, it's, it's true. It's, it yeah. is the best piece of advice I could give. Because it is much easier to explain to a 25-year-old how to use Etherscan than to explain to a 60-year-old that's been using World Check to check uh, uh, sanction screening. So that is like the no bullshit advice that I would give to regulators. Um, and then also I would automate a lot of compliance processes. So for example, we're used to, or regulators are used to, taking a sample of transactions to check. That's what you used to do if you're using a traditional bank. But if you're doing your stuff on-chain, then you can use companies like Compli uh, sorry, TRM Labs, uh, Chain Analysis, and others that automate your... Uh, so basically, uh, my advice to regulators, other than hiring younger people, actually younger people will allow you to do that automation, but um, so I think, yeah, regulators need to have someone that knows how to understand code. And I've, I've seen that, the difference with regulators that have that and regulators that don't, because you can invest a lot in setting up systems that automate your monitoring. So for example, uh, outgoing transactions from crypto exchanges, you don't need to take a sample on a monthly basis like you used to do with banks, because that stuff can be automated on chain. Um, that's, I guess, on, on the regulatory side. And so you can check every single transaction. You don't without you don't checking it yourself. There's a code that checks it for you. Yeah, I, I, I think automation goes, goes a, a very long, long way. Um, and then what, what we're planning on doing at CoinMina is where we see the future of exchanges and finance. So today, crypto exchanges offer, or I think they will diverge into two ways. You have ones that are closer to casinos, and that's the Binance's 50x leverage type, go lose your money type on, on, on whatever Pepe coin or, or whatever uh, stuff they're listing uh, next. That's, that's, that's one angle crypto exchanges will take, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's casinos all over the world, but um, so in my opinion, leverage exchanges are closer to the casino business model where they make money from their customer and not uh, just taking a fee. They literally liquidate their customer in order to take their money. That's one business model that we're not interested in at, at CoinMina. And the other one that we are interested in is where you start offering real financial services using crypto rails. So today, if you hold Ethereum, there's no reason why you can't stake that Ether to make five, four, whatever interest or whatever profit the Ethereum blockchain is, is, is paying out. Um, and then there's also no reason why you can't spend that money using a Visa card or, or similar. So I think uh, the future of many exchanges will go towards becoming closer to retail and commercial banks. Obviously, we will not say the word bank in our pitch because then we have to be significantly more regulated. Uh, so we'll find another more creative way of, of providing financial services, but really we're competing with banks, right? You're allowing people to send and receive money. You're allowing them to generate passive income on their investments. Soon enough, you'll be able to give them loans. Um, but actually, the way that I see the future of this is 
you will have centralized exchanges that allow you to access decentralized applications. So today, MakerDAO has a beautiful system for lending and borrowing that is determined by code. But in order to take a loan from MakerDAO, you need to manage your own private key on MetaMask. And guess what? If I go tell my uncle or dad, you know, hey, listen, you can get 50% uh, on your collateral in terms of loans. Like, yeah, sign me up. And then I tell him, okay, but you need to set up MetaMask and manage your keys. And if you lose this key, your money is gone. Yeah, then that, that's not the way towards the billion users, uh, as you rightly mentioned. So I imagine people having a username, password, Google 2FA, and then using that, they're able to access all the various decentralized applications. So it's a pretty long rant uh, to, to, to your question on regulators and what products we have, but yeah, that's... So you want to simplify the process as much as possible and make it easy for your clients also to be able to trade. Um, how would you convince your grandfather to actually be able to trade? Yeah, so actually my grandfather was one of CoinMina's test customers. Oh, really? When, when Yeah, he's 86 years old, but he's one of the people that we actually have go through the app because, uh, I mean, his understanding of technology as an 86-year-old is, is, is good. But yeah, we, any feature that's going to have a change on user experience, we actually test with him. Uh, he was here earlier today. But um, yeah, I mean... Um, in terms of the products and services that crypto exchanges um, will offer, I think we'll see uh, banks and crypto exchanges both start to compete on areas that they haven't competed yep. in the past. So banks are always late to the game, but the reality is banks will go like vultures to anything that has high margins. And crypto has insane margins, so I think it's only a matter of time until we see banks also starting to compete uh, with, with, with crypto businesses. I think so, too. Um, Toya, what are some of the innovations and products that um, Bit.com is going to start offering? And who are you going after? Some of the services and things like that that you're thinking about besides um, options? Or is it going to be your exchange going to be just focused on options? Because they're not actually regulated right now, you know that. There's no license for, um, uh, for derivative options at this time, so. Not, not globally at this moment, but uh, established crypto options exchange do run uh, since 2018. Yep, uh, with Deribit, your competitor. The, our, our leader in this industry, hmm. I would will, I will say, say that. So um, the, the the finance industry is, is taking, let's say, 50 years of development, and their uh, instrument has been evolving from time to time. Um, and it's getting more and more advanced, and, and the trading teams are, are having more and more advanced strategies, or the strategies change, or their, um, uh, the requirement of the exchanges and latencies change. So everything is moving forward. And as a crypto industry, as an exchange, which is by and large Web2 business as of now, um, we have a lot to catch up. So we just look at what traditional exchanges are doing and we're just copying and accelerate how we do things uh, compared to what they did in the past 50 years in terms of uh, providing more creative uh, trading instrument or asset management in uh, instrument. Um, giving better technology or fixed connectivities that all the, um, the in, in institutional traders are asking for. So those are a lot of things that we can do, uh, including indexes, ETFs that we can, we can add. So from the Web2 perspective, we have a lot more to do. But on the, on the other side, like we are still um, doing a, a cryptocurrency uh, business and we shouldn't confine ourselves in uh, what traditional finance has already taught us to do. We should also expand outside of it. That means that there are a lot of DeFi or um, if, if uh, we are opening our eyes, DeFi trading or derivatives trading has already been popular among retails, but it hasn't been uh, really caught up by the institutions, which means the real big money hasn't cut in yet. So DeFi or Web3, which uh, some of the exchange leader ex exchanges have the, the capacity has already trying to bring a hybrid mod model of exchanges combining 
centralized exchanges to decentralized exchanges and offering a, a mixture of services that link the wallet of a centralized custody wallet with a Web3 wallet where you hold your own private key. So there are also like, um, I would say in terms of depth and in terms of width that we all, all need to expand. Um, considering that, like the, the remark that I need to make is like really, um, we are in the very infancy of this industry, even though we are only focusing on the finance part uh, of the Web3 or digital asset sphere. Because if we look outside of finance, there are more things mm -hmm. going on. Uh, there, there is utility, there is infrastructure, there, there is lending and borrowing, and there is, there, um, there is community DAO, a lot of other things happening, but we uh, are focusing on finance and far from enough at this moment. Will you start with market making and offering market makers, for example, a position within the derivative options products that you're going to be um, launching. You've launched already, right? Launched already. Yeah. yeah. So people can play with your system already. Yeah. Um, will you be offering other products and services, or will you start the decentralization process? So we were not ready to go and embrace decentralized yet. Uh, so the the options market is very uh, small. I will I will put it in this way. So if you count how many options trader in the world. Um, first of all, the top 10 traders will probably contribute 90% of trading volume of options. And there are probably only 50 options trader firms uh, in the market at this moment. Um, and FTX brought down some of them, <laughs> so, unfortunately. So, so, but it's, it's very hard to, to uh, market make for options market. Um, a lot of our clients actually come from the traditional finance background or the crypto focused teams, actually the team got out of traditional finance and, and then build their own uh, crypto focused market making team for crypto options. So that's where we are at this moment. So simplifying the options trading or simplifying the, the crypto structured product would also be very necessary for uh, crypto in, like uh, adoption uh, as the next step, yeah. Agree. We have been, to, to allow for the purposes of this conference, all three of us have been learning so much about the UAE and um, just about the Middle East in this great tour. So thank you to Finiverse for this. Um, and for me, it's my first time actually in Abu Dhabi. Um, what role do you all see uh, for the UAE to play in your businesses um, going forward and your global plans and for the global crypto industry? Uh, do you want to start first, Wayne, in terms of what yeah. you think? Sure. Especially um, after being here for the last few days. We're super excited to be here um, in Abu Dhabi. Uh, last trip, our co-founder Winston's trip here, we thought he was going to stay for two weeks. He ended up staying for two months. Um, uh, we're here this time because we see tremendous opportunity for the UAE in global um, remittances especially in B2B remittances. Uh, Winston and I co-founded with other colleagues the Unitas protocol, which is a DeFi protocol that mints out unitized stablecoins. And uh, we're really looking forward to working with partners here. So let me explain what is a unitized stablecoin. Um, we see opportunity to create the Duram dollar here in the UAE. Oh, wow. So let me tell the story of the Euro dollar. Um, in the 1960s, uh, European nations and uh, wealthy families realized that they had huge risk because a lot of their wealth were parked in dollars. But not only that, uh, it, they were banked uh, in by, uh, with US-based banks, right? And that gave 
um, them a lot of vulnerability in negotiations with the United States. So um, Russia and the UK initiated the euro dollar movement and enabled Russian, uh, I'm sorry, uh, UK based banks to start to offer dollar banking services, right? So you would have these UK banks offering US dollar banking and uh, they were offering deposits, savings accounts, uh, uh, remittances, B2B payments, where it's denominated in the US dollar and the liabilities were in the US dollar, so it felt like a US dollar bank account, but the underlying, the reserves, were European treasuries, gold, and oil, right? And that gave them the financial sovereignty that they needed, that they were still using the US dollar, but that they had a lot more sovereignty than before. So in this euro dollar concept, um, while the US dollar is controlled by the Fed and United States, the dollar itself is just a unit of account, just like an hour of time or a kilometer of distance. And that is what uh, the uh, UNITAS protocol allows us to do. It mints out, for example, um, AED packed DeFi tokens whose value is every second packed to the DRAM AED while the reserve could be something else, right? On the, for, uh, on the contrary, we're very much looking forward to the UNITAS protocol minting out the DRAM dollar. So these would be tokens whose value are constantly packed to the US dollar and can be used like a stable coin, just like USDC and USDT, whereas the underlying reserve may be over-reserved exogenously with fractionalized, uh, with um, tokenized AED bank deposits or AED CBDCs. So your plan is to launch this here as a part of maybe your future growth and get licensed here? Yeah, our plans are to work with regulators here and partners here and also banks here to develop and launch this here. Hmm. Is this something that the two of you can actually work on now that you both have met each other? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's and what are your plans for the UAE or further plans because you're already here? Yeah, so um, I live here, and I think uh, you know, there's you know, for me, actions are what I've been super bullish about the UAE for a long time, but now I've made it my home and can see myself staying here uh, long term. Um, I think the UAE is the most exciting country in the world. I don't think any city can compete from a growth perspective. And this is not something that started to happen recently. We have to remember that Sheikh Mohammed's late father, Sheikh Rashid, when he built Dubai ports, the size of Dubai port was twice the size of any ship globally. So Dubai always plans way ahead in advance. You saw, or not only Dubai, the UAE, I, I should give credit to not only Dubai, but the wider UAE. Um, so yeah, I guess for us, we, you know, there's only so much I can do as Coin Mina, but we have to be in the right jurisdiction, which in my opinion is, is the UAE, the right industry, which is crypto. So if you're doing your job and you're part of a fast growing geography and a fast growing industry, then you benefit from the momentum of that. Like honestly, at, at Coin Mina, um, we've had so many customers join because they've left Russia, they've left Ukraine, they've left China, they've left Jordan to move to the UAE and find uh, services that they want. So you're benefiting on the spillover of people moving in, in, into the country. And to be completely honest, from a business standpoint, the quality of customers that you're receiving are all high value, high disposable income uh, and keen on business. Um, and that's not a dynamic that you have in, 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 in many jurisdictions. Um, on the stablecoin issue inside, I think it's super interesting. Um, but I think there's always 
a risk when you want to slightly compete with the regulator. Uh, it needs to be done in alignment with them. I think we've seen uh, Paxos in the U.S. Uh, launched BUSD, which was a very innovative regulatory arbitrage system because Paxos wasn't really Binance, but that stablecoin was serving Binance. Uh, but if you put the U.S flag next to your offering, it has to be kind of sanctioned by Uncle Sam or they're going to shut you down as soon as you reach a specific level. So, um, yeah, I think I yeah, still haven't made up my, on my mind on privately issued uh, stable coins because there's multiple counterparty risks and, and yeah, I guess the counterparty risk and custody is, is still opaque in my opinion because let's say real estate uh, tokens. People create a real estate token. But what if the real owner goes and transfers the ownership at the land registry? So there has to be a link between the on-chain and the off-chain for that to work. So for example, tokenized AED deposits is a brilliant idea if there's an ability to link the token with that. Uh, but that's, that's the job of, 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 of startups, right? Or, or tech companies is to figure out problems or inefficiencies that have been there in the previous system and use technology to, to, to bring those. So Consider would, the liquidity yeah. model, right? LUS.com in terms of thinking about UAE. I, I actually spent uh, entire last year uh, looking at different jurisdictions uh, regulation framework. So scouting the whole global framework and, and found that uh, UAE has the most friendly uh, one of the most friendly jurisd jurisdiction, um, and also the 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 clearer uh, framework for us to get the license. So we are in the process of acquiring license, and we are in the process of setting up uh, our global headquarter in UAE wow. and start our hiring. So uh, it's, that's it's, great news. It, it's it's an important first step for us uh, here cool. in UAE. Yeah. Wow. Okay, we're running up. I'm told that time is up, but I'd like to leave with one thing. Can we, each of you, make a prediction of a, either a product or something about your exchange for the future? Let's make a prediction and see what happens in a year's time. It can be anything. Uh, it can be a thousand times growth or whatever it happens to be. But um, some prediction for financial innovation. Somebody want to start? I, I can start here. Oh, yeah. um, before having the prediction, I want to put a disclaimer here um, because it's a prediction about my own exchange, right? So still, like the, the market is changing too fast, too fast, too fast. So uh, it's basically like what if, if not for those great entrepreneurs that developed uh, the Google, Facebook, the Web2 space would probably be entirely different than what we are now. Um, but in terms of Web3, still like it's depending on several great minds from my point, point, point of view, great minds, where to lead us because the market still has a lot of noise. Um, it doesn't mean it's, it's bad because everyone is exploring from their different uh, fronts. So from the exchange point of view, uh, a bold prediction is that exchange is going to be um, the, f the functions is going to be segregated. In instead of one exchange holding the, uh, the custody or wallet, user money exchange, um, the settlements, everything themselves. So again, like traditional market ha are se separated for a reason because of risk control and user protection. So probably it's going to go um, like into different layers of user experience, like, okay, right. as a user, especially in UAE, probably I don't want to trade myself, but I'm very uh, inclined to have some, hand over my money to some asset management firms to help me manage the money. So the user interface or the service providers are going to be uh, very much different from now. Wow. Let's hope for that, and it'll be great financial innovation to see different user interfaces. Wayne, over to you, and I'm going to give Talal the last word because he's the local boy here. What's so, your prediction for your exchange, your financial innovation, or exchanges in general? So uh, I'll give a prediction about our own exchange, Xprex, because that's where I have the most insider information. I think um, because of Xprex's support for local currency on off ramps 
and uh, because of its use of the Unitas protocols, DeFi, locally packed stable coins, it's, it will become one of the largest changes by volume and by number of users in emerging markets, both for spot trading and also for cross-border remittances. Cool. Last word, Talal, what's your prediction? Yeah, so I don't think that the biggest potential for crypto is in mature markets like the US or the UK or where you already have banking services and Stripe and all these online payments. Really, the best use for crypto today is in emerging markets. Go ask someone in Egypt what they want and they'll tell you just USDT because first of all, it's self-sovereign to some extent um, and then or it's way more sovereign. I shouldn't say self-sovereign because that is for Bitcoin. But uh, for USDT, it's way more sovereign than a bank account. And it does not have a falling value, which is the case for many markets such as Turkey, Egypt. Uh, so, yeah, I don't think that uh, crypto's silver bullet is in mature markets. And it's more in emerging markets. As for CoinMina, our goal is to get uh, Bitcoin in the hands or in the self-custody wallets of a million users in the Middle East. So... So your prediction is to have 100% adoption in the next five years of... No, it's that very far away from 100% adoption. You have over 400 million people in, in, okay. in, in the Middle East and we're aiming for, for just the first one. So okay. eventually we'll aim for the 100%, but okay. uh, slow and steady wins the race. Perfect. On that note, I hope That's all our predictions here come true. And thank you for being a great panel. Toya, Talal, Wayne, thank you. Thank you for being a great audience. And um, a big congratulations today for Finiverse. Thank you.